is a little bit more of a discussion on stakeholder mapping. And the way that I wanted to start this sort of conversation is on the framing, actually. And I think that it's really important when we're talking about this, because I'm not sure that we're going to get to Josh Epstein's challenge of, of finding the, the full and real uh, scientific truth in terms of what a stakeholder mapping might entail. But I think what we have to recognize is that there, if this is a whole system of a bunch of different stakeholders, we're only on the edge of that. And there's a, quite a few met, uh, methods that can get you a little bit of an insight into that, um, into that whole big network. And then there are a few methods that can get you a little bit bigger. But that's about as far as you can go. We're never going to necessarily know the whole and full network. And I guess it is a question of whether or not you really need to. Um, but I think that that's why when we talk about stakeholder mapping, and I've used that term uh, to be a generic catch-all, um, we need to really be thinking about what the objective is of what we're trying to do with it. So um, if we're trying to understand how we personally can engage in a system, we don't necessarily need um, secondary sources. We can work with our, uh, within our groups and within our communities to do something like an alignment, interest, and influence matrix or a power cube type analysis, which is, I think, an approach that the Bangladesh team did in the first instance. Uh, but let's say we need to go a little bit beyond that. So we don't just want to understand how we can engage in a particular small subset of a system. I say system, but I think I mean subset of a system. Um, but we want to understand broader implications of our engagement in the system. Then we might want to use tools like participatory impact pathways analysis or net map approach, which starts to bring in external uh, people into the whole network mapping process. But if we want to simply describe how a system, simply I say, uh, <laughs> how a system is working and kind of try and understand what that uh, network looks like, then uh, some of the stakeholder analysis tools that we did where we actually went out and did surveys, et cetera, can be really useful as can some of the more uh, social network analyses. Uh, so it gets beyond where your personal role is within the system. So uh, what I wanted to do then in this short presentation, and then I have an exercise to hopefully make sure that you're still uh, following along, uh, was to outline three of those different tools, the first one, one from each of those boxes. So we'll go for, through the alignment, interest, and influence matrix, the PIPA, or the participatory impact pathways analysis, and then uh, we'll do a little bit of an exercise on social network analysis so that we can get to play a little bit with the Google Fusion tables. In terms of the alignment, interest, and influence matrix, it's actually a tool that was uh, developed uh, in part by Ben Ramalingam uh, and Enrique Mendizabal at uh, the Overseas Development Institute. Uh, it's based on a power cube type analysis, but it has two different axes uh, for the different actors. So one is the level of alignment, and one is the level of interest in a particular topic. And I think that um, interest can be kind of a challenging word <laughs> because I think that people uh, tend to conflate interest and um, in actually doing something versus, uh, well, um, now I'm trying to remember all of the words that I used to use to, do, to describe this. Uh, I'll think about, uh, let, well, let's go through an example here and we'll, we'll see how we go forward. But effectively what this tool is supposed to help you to do, you can either do it by yourself or you can do it in a small group of your researchers, is figure out, map a few of the key actors, figure out what their positions are, and then to develop a strategy for how you might want to actually engage those actors. So um, there are a few examples, but the first step is certainly to identify the various stakeholders and to figure out um, how much in agreement they are with a certain policy proposal, for example, and to what extent it's a priority for them to act on. Um, so you have people in the top right corner that you might want to learn in partnership with them. So they're very aligned, um, they're very much in agreement with it, uh, they're very much interested in a topic, but these are not the type of people that you want to invest tons of effort trying to move in one way or the other because these are the people that are already your friends. Uh, the more interesting categories are the folks on the sides. Maybe I can actually figure out how to use this. Uh, is it the green one? Yes, okay. Um, the people on these two boxes, where you can either have people who really much agree with the particular proposal uh, and you want to convince them that they make it more of a priority. So you want to develop their enthusiasm or their interest to address that particular topic. 
Um, or you have the people who are really interested in a particular topic but uh, don't necessarily agree with your particular approach. And so that's a difficult one, but you might want to work on challenging beliefs. Uh, people in this group, uh, I've had various different strategies for dealing with. Sometimes you leave them alone and hope they don't notice what you're doing. Uh, sometimes you try and get them on board. And I guess that goes to the third part of the alignment, interest, and influence matrix. Once you've figured out who uh, some of your actors are um, and where you want them to go, you, or you can also uh, focus on certain ones by circling particular ones that you think are the most powerful or the most influential within the, the system uh, and really focus resources and efforts there. And from there, uh, think about different strategies that you might use to work with these different groups. So uh, on your left hand side, this one suggests uh, media activities, really trying to uh, encourage them to put this on the agenda. Here it might be around developing a community of practice. There it might be around uh, pilot evaluations or projects, and those folks are really difficult to deal with because the more you tell them that they're wrong, the, the more they disagree with you. Um, so you have to proceed with care on that one. Um, but so it's really a quite straightforward process. We, I've done it in groups. Like I said, I've done it on the back of a napkin before. Uh, Diffit has done it in the middle of each day was they were doing different um, negotiations um, to just see how people have changed throughout the day. Uh, so it's to agree with some sort of policy objective, uh, list some of the key actors, locate them on the matrix, identify the most influential, uh, and then think about which ones you can actually influence and who you have connections to, uh, and map where you'd like them to be and how you might get them there. So that's a very brief overview of the alignment, interest, and influence matrix. That's if you're trying to engage in a system. If you're trying to see how some of your effects, uh, your engagement might have broader outcomes, I guess we could say, uh, one of the ways to do it is to actually get some of the other stakeholders involved. And that's what the participatory impact pathways analysis or the PIPA can do. Now this is the approach that the STEP Center tends to focus on. Um, and they don't do the full PIPA. PIPA as an approach was developed by um, Boru Duthwaite, who actually also did the innovation histories, which I hadn't really realized before. So he's a, a big participatory uh, champion. Uh, but the step center doesn't do the whole thing. They don't start with the um, causal analysis or problem tree. They assume that that's kind of been done as they've been developing the projects. And I think in applying it to FHS, we've certainly already done theories of change, which <laughs> effectively map out those same sort of things. I suppose you could probably use a causal loop diagram in a very similar way as um, a theory of change, except for causal loops tend to be more explanatory where theories of change are instrumental in how you're going to engage the system. But it starts by very much thinking about the vision or the objective and creating then a how network map. Uh, and then based on the network map, I think it's really important, and maybe this is another one of those things that I should have put in the communicating complexity thing, is I think you have to try a combination of different ideas. A lot of times if you just see a visualization of something without knowing what you're supposed to be looking for or directing your attention in some way, it's very difficult to understand those. So um, they also create an impact narrative based on this network map. Now, um, so yes, that's in uh, more directly. There are a few things that you would do before an actual project, which is on the problem for formulation, et cetera. Uh, and then at a, at a PIPA type workshop, you would talk about the project goal or the vision for impact. Uh, before creating the map and then taking a look at the strategy. So in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the alignment, interest, and influence matrix, but there are lots of different ways of organizing it. So um, the way that the step center approaches it um, is they do bring in uh, external actors sometimes, so it's not just the individual research groups, uh, and they have different colored pieces of paper for different types of actor. Um, I think red are policy makers, uh, yellow are CSOs, uh, I can find the whole list for you, but uh, there's <laughs> you end up with a lot of a very colorful map that can either be organized uh, depending on what's relevant for, for the project. So it can be organized by geography, so you might have a cluster of people in the same sort of area. Um, it might be organized by how people relate to each other in terms, so a little bit more like a social network analysis. Um, when we did one pr previously for the Step Center um, health strand of work, we actually organized it around um, outcome mapping principles, which talks about uh, your sphere of control, which is mainly within your partners, your sphere of influence, 
and then your uh, sphere of impact, basically. So um, there are lots of different ways of doing that. But then um, instead of using, uh, uh, circling which ones we think are most influential here, what we actually have is three different colored beans. Uh, and we used um, black beans to indicate that they would be positive or receptive to uh, the, whatever the, the objective is. Um, we had red ones for blockers, and we had uh, white ones, I think, for neutral. So the idea is that individuals can kind of have a little bit of a discussion, but it allows for a lot more. You don't have to have one <laughs> particular view in quite the same way that the alignment, interest, and influence matrix does. Uh, I think one of the things that is often quite difficult when it comes to social network analyses, um, network maps, etc., is the issue of granularity. Are, are you talking about an organization? Are you talking about a department within an organization? Are you talking about individuals? Uh, and so this, the, the bean counters are, are kind of a way of potentially um, allowing for different groups representing different parts of an organization, for example. Uh, I think, as Annie put it before, this is, not, this is not really a, in and of itself, a research methodology, but I think it can really help in project planning. Um, and actually, the way that I think that it can be quite useful is retrospectively talking about what has happened and kind of the way that we think that it happened and telling a story of that's actor-centered and, and, and actor-based. Um, so that usually takes several hours, so I'm afraid it's very difficult for us to sit here and, <laughs> and do this all together. But I wanted to just show you a little bit about what it looked like uh, in a few different contexts. I think that um, one of them, the environmental, oh, the environmental health in India, that one might look familiar to some of you involved in the steps. Uh, center in India. Good. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to talk then very briefly about social network analysis. I think there's some other people in the room who, again, have lots of experience on this and maybe <laughs> will uh, chip in uh, as we go along. Um, I, I think that we've had, you know, I remember in Uganda two years ago having conversations about social network analysis and um, have it sharing lots of papers and things around it. So I didn't really want to go into too much uh, introductory detail of what a social network analysis is. I think a lot of people know what it is. Uh, it's about cr finding nodes and cr linking them together uh, through what are called edges. Uh, and either those can be directional or not. Um, and uh, you end up uh, with a network that may or may not look something like that. The color and the size of the different nodes can vary depending on a number of different factors, as can the um, strength of the different ties. There are a number of descriptors that you can calculate based on a social network analysis, everything from centrality, which this uh, network map is actually colored by centrality. So those in the deep blue are the most connected, the most central to the entire network, have the least number of um, steps from them to the uh, ends of the network. Density, this would be a very dense network. There is a lot of interconnectivity. Uh, you, one of the interesting things I find about network, uh, social network analysis is that you can find some that are very, very interconnected and then sometimes um, you get these bridges of one or two people that link between big clusters or sometimes you get a very um, loose network. So. Um, that's one of the ways of talking about it, the distance between different hops of the network, uh, the tie strength, um, and I think that a lot of these will come, uh, and reci reciprocity, so do the people link back to each other, um, will come to life as we actually uh, have, I guess we have 15 minutes to go ahead and get hands on with one of them. Um, in terms of how you approach it, <sighs> I think that maybe we should have uh, Upasana talk more about how the, the struggles she's had in, in uh, trying, to, trying to actually uh, get a social network analysis um, up and running. Uh, one way of doing it is starting from yourselves, but you can certainly do uh, a survey. Um, I guess there are potential questions about sampling. Again, you want to have issues of granularity. Are you talking about individuals in a social network analysis? Are you talking about organizations? Um, that I just saw a paper that I can share that did um, a mapping of organizations and then did a shadow network mapping, um, which was more of the, the people behind the scenes or how they were, were related. Um, so there are different ways of doing that. In terms of surveys and things, there might be node limiting, so you might not want to know every single person that another person knows. 
uh, depending on what your research question is, having knowing the top three or the top five might be sufficient. Um, and then there are types of different flows. And I think that the type of question that you ask obviously paints a very different map. And so getting the research question right, I think, is probably the most important part of a social network analysis. So there are two uh, tools that I've used um, and that I think some in the room have used as well to help with social network analysis. One of them is Google Fusion Tables, which uh, you can install as a plug-in on Google Drive. 